Bob, to believe in God, which I certainly want to do, I have to take the whole package. And that package includes, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, some sort of a new creation, a new world, a millennium, some thing dramatically different that is going to occur in the future and try to reconcile this with science. You, you have this really interesting phrase that says if the universe is going to be transformed by God, it had to be created to be transformable. Mm -hmm. what, what does that mean? Well, I pr appreciate your, your, your point. I mean, for me, the new creation is a conversation about the future of the universe that God has for it based, for me as a Christian, on the resurrection of Christ. And most biblical theologians who take the resurrection in a sort of complete sense of bodily, it's not just a kind of appearance and giving hope, talk about it as transformation. That is, it's the same Jesus of Nazareth who Mary encounters as our Lord, but he's transformed into a, a timelessness beyond suffering, he's life eternal, the Lord of life. So they talk about continuity in discontinuity, transformation. It isn't just a kind of Gnostic, you know, his spirit goes to God and the body decays in the grave. Nor is it what in the New Testament account happened to Lazarus, where he's brought back to life, but eventually dies, a kind of resuscitation. So the, 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 the kind of concept that most New Testament scholars deal with is this concept of transformation, that there is continuity and discontinuity. Let's explore that because you use the resurrection of Jesus as the prototype. Right. Let's talk <clears throat> about what the type is. What what will this new creation be that is to be in the future? You talk right. about again continuity and discontinuity. Most mm -hmm. people would think it's sort of a complete, if it's real, a total <clears throat> discontinuity. If God's creating some sort of a spiritual world, but you say no, there has to be some continuity as well. Right. Well, there are tremendous diversities in. The Christian tradition, as I understand it, so I'm I'm not trying to speak normatively for it. There is a tradition of the soul, right after death, goes to heaven, and that's a very important tradition that comes from Augustine and goes forward. I'm speaking for the tradition that is more Pauline in orientation. When Paul talks in Corinthians about what this resurrection is, and he really has these wonderful models of of change, but but continuity, and. That tradition, I think, really captures the New Testament gospel accounts of what happened to Jesus, that it wasn't a spiritual uh, resurrection and his body decays. It really was something that transformed the whole person to this new person. Then how do you go from that example to what will happen to the earth, to the universe, right. to the whole cosmos? Well, again, you're <laughs> pointing to one, probably the hardest problem in the theology and science domain, and only a few of us are really working on it. It's a immensely complicated challenge. But if we can't deliver on something, it's hard to understand how you'll deal with the problem of suffering in nature. What is that about? And God's suffering with us. A God who suffers with us never transforms and is victorious, isn't much of a God. So I think all's at stake in the issue, and yet it's, it's really murky. Uh, nevertheless, you get certain senses of it. The thing that I you began with saying, if God is to transform the universe, it must be transformable, means there must be something about it now that will be about it forever. There are certain elements of continuity just like Jesus was still Jesus, even though he was transformed into his way of being Jesus, there's got to be something about the universe now. It's beauty, right? It's mathematics, um, compassion. I mean, the joy of eating and living and being physical, those must be qualities that somehow are embedded in its future that we'll, we will rejoice in forever. At the same time, those all go along with sort of natural suffering, which can't be part of the future. I hate to ask something seemingly mundane in your glorious exposition of all these wonderful things, but I mean, the individual atoms of which we're all composed, will, will those be transformed? Uh, will we have a different kinds of atoms? Will they be the same kinds of things? Or just one will disappear and a new kind come? Or Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> as, as always, you're hitting on the right questions. It's really hard to walk this walk because it could so, so sound like fantasy and science fiction or it could so sound so literal and, and uh, that it couldn't be correct. I mean, it's very hard to get a balance here, so let right. me just say that up uh, uh, front. And it's also a traditional question. You know, when the martyrs were being martyred, uh, one of the questions was, what happens to them if their bodies are eaten by lions? And th it's a really serious question. So th this question of what's the element of continuity about the person? Is it material? Is it atoms? Is it bodily? Is it spiritual, my soul? 
or is it something about the whole person? That's one of the issues. Another issue is how do you think of that? Do you think of a change in the laws of nature so your body or your atoms are continuous but they have different properties? Or do you think of it as such a radical change that nothing about us uh, inherits the, the kingdom of God? And, and th again, all we have right now are sort of boundary questions. We know where the, the foul balls go, but it's very hard to hit one that's a you know a home run. I mean, we know you don't want to treat dis you don't want to be so afraid of being literal or science fiction-y that you make it purely psychological or spiritual because the person is more than spiritual. Same time, you don't want to make it so literal that it becomes a resuscitation. And <laughs> it's things are the way they were except you're living again and, and to suffer again. Right. So those are the boundaries and the challenge is to find to engage science about what we know about the world as it is now to look for things which seem plausibly as to be in the future. For example, look at thermodynamics again. This is an area where I've suggested before in other places that there may be areas of thermodynamics like entropy and dissipation and so on that's part of what is pre uh, required for natural suffering and, and, and moral evil, even though you can't reduce it to it. But there are elements of thermodynamics which are involved in the beauty of life and joy and spontaneity and lo living and love and food and existence that are part of what makes for what we call good. Well, perhaps the new creation will have those elements of thermodynamics but not the former ones. If Augustine said, in this world we cannot not sin, in the next world we cannot sin, maybe in this world we've got the whole package of thermodynamics, say. Whereas in the next world, we have those aspects which contribute to life, but don't contribute to death and, and disease and suffering. Does this now include the totality of creation? I think one conversation is about the person, whether right. it's a mortal soul or how we're transformed, and we focus on that. But the, certainly the Bible talks about a transformation of, of the whole creation. Well, exactly. And it, I think it's important not only because one has that whole a, a kind of apocalyptic view of the transformation of creation, but also because in conversations around natural suffering and theodicy, natural theodicy, what's the point of all that suffering? Is it just to get us humans on board? Heaven knows. You can't have a means-end argument for, to justify suffering in over three billion years of evolution. It's got to mean every species, at least, or perhaps every individual in a population counts after all, God creates them. So that this view of, of eschatology as transformation is really of the whole history of life on Earth. Well, you can't stop there. What about life in the universe? So in some sense, it, if you put it quickly, if the universe is what we mean by creation in the doctrine of creation, then the universe, what we mean by new creation, that is, there's not a second ex nihilo. You don't just dump this universe and create a new one with the right laws. Yeah. It's a transformation of the universe. Not only, not only the visible universe, but if there are maker universes, those too. Now, that's where the language, again, skitters off into sounding like a science fiction or wishful thinking, and that's all. So you have to go back and ground it in what you can in terms of biblical sources, in terms of the tradition, in terms of these questions, the ways in which it's been looked at. But at least you, we've got some sense of the boundary conditions of where you've gone too far. As difficult as this is, it's essential to do because to avoid it avoids the fundamental nature of what certainly the Judeo-Christian religions propound. Exactly. You'd leave, in shorthand, you'd leave Jesus suffering on death on the cross and that'd be it. There wouldn't be a resurrection, which is why I'm a Christian. And you wouldn't, and you couldn't have a resurrection unless it has some sort of universal consequence. I mean, that's just given. Paul was clearest about it. Paul said, if there isn't a universal resurrection, which as a Pharisee Jew he believed in, if there isn't, then Christ couldn't have been resur resurrected. And we're the biggest of fools. So for Paul, what was exciting about Jesus' resurrection was the first instance of what was going to happen. But if science says it can't happen in general, then for Paul it couldn't have happened to Jesus. So I can't be satisfied with just what happened to Jesus. I have to be committed to it having it being a, a foretaste or foresign of what will happen to all of humanity, all of life on earth, all of the universe.